Our planet has four and a half billion years experience in organizing workable living systems and fitting new species into the pattern. We're the only species that has to do it by our own conscious design. And that puts us into this very interesting point now where we have to make a shift. We're again like a child that's very creative and inventive and it makes all these inventions and makes a huge mess in the process. Welcome to Worth Quoting, a speaker series sponsored by Florida Community College of Jacksonville. I'm Carol Miner, your host, and our special guest today is Hazel Henderson, who is a futurist, and Elizabeth Satoris, who is a futurist as well. Now, Elizabeth's a biologist, and Hazel's a green economist, which is very unique. And we're going to talk about the sustainable future and the 1990s being critical, a critical time. Hazel has recently written a book called Paradigms in Progress. And we really want to start there, Hazel, with why you think that this is a critical time in the Earth's history for the sustainable future. Well, I think human beings have come to the point on this planet now where the next, uh, really the next decade is going to have to be a turnaround decade in terms of us coming to terms with the planet and realizing that the planet isn't growing and that we had better redefine what we mean by economic growth. We better redefine what we mean by progress or else the planet's going to explode or else we're going to pollute uh, ourselves um, into an early grave. And so, in a sense, what I'm trying to do uh, is to look at these processes that are now occurring on this planet where human beings are creating global forces that never operated on the planet before and are changing everything, which in turn, of course, is forcing us to change our societies. And these six great globalizations really are the globalization of the Industrial Revolution, where all of our globe girdling technology of jets and everything else all around the planet the globalization of production where you never know where your automobile is actually made anymore it looks like an American automobile but actually it was made in Taiwan or assembled in Japan and then there's the globalization of finance where you now have this 24-hour global casino where there's 500 billion dollars worth of currencies are sloshing around this planet on the electronic funds transfer system you know with these uh, currency traders. And this is making it impossible for governments to manage the domestic economy. And then you look at the globalization of work, where uh, corporations are going all over the planet looking for cheap labor. And at the same time, workers are crossing borders trying to find work, whether it's Mexicans coming to the US or whether it's East Europeans uh, preparing to flood into West Europe looking for uh, better jobs. Then you have the global globalization of pollution and we all see that it's not just a local matter of the St. John's River anymore we're now talking the ozone layer we're now talking global warming and then you have the globalization of the arms race and although the globe the uh, Cold War is over we now have um, both in the old Soviet republics and in this country, many people um, looking for new enemies, um, old cold warriors, you know, who only know um, how to fire nuclear missiles. Um, they're trying to, uh, which dictators should we go and have a little war against next? You know, this is all very dangerous stuff. And then we now have the globalization of culture, where everybody in the world sees Dallas on the TV and Miami Vice, and they look at American life lifestyles and they think hey you know we all want to live like this and at the same time you do have the emergence of what I call global citizens and whenever I go all over the world I say lead me to the global citizens and they're all experiencing this same kind of level uh, and and what this is leading to is the restructuring of all of these societies you know it's not just perestroika in the breakup of the old Soviet Union every country on this planet 
planet is being restructured by these global forces. So it means that um, we're going to expect a lot of change in the next decade. Elizabeth, maybe you could talk about that from a biologist's point of view and what this means mm. for a sustainable future. It is an extremely interesting time from a biologist's perspective. As Hazel says, the globalization of everything is happening and we're becoming more conscious of it. And in a sense, the human species has to start behaving like a single body because it's occupied the whole planet and because there's really nowhere else to go. Uh, 20 years ago, we still thought we could move into tin cans in the sky, but we're catching on that there's too much likelihood of breakdown and that you can't really export uh, ecological systems and make a living that way in a, in a sealed tin can in the sky. So it's on the planet. We are of this planet. We are in need of its oxygen, its waters, its soils, and that makes us face things in a whole new way. But as a biologist, I see the human species as being right now in the midst of its adolescent crisis. It's still a very new species compared to others, and every species that comes about, that evolves, has to fit itself into the larger living system. We haven't done that well yet. When I say adolescent crisis, uh, it's because we're half ego thinking that we're flying spaceship Earth. The ultimate mechanical me metaphor is spaceship Earth. We're at the controls. We're running it. The other side is the tremendous anxiety that we won't survive at all, that we're a species in danger of its own extinction, of creating its own extinction. So you have this adolescent crisis, half ego, half anxiety. And that's the stage right before maturity when we could grow up. And I like to tell the Mark Twain story about the young man leaving home a few years and uh, then coming back, listening to his father and saying, gee, Dad, you learned a lot while I was gone. And of course we laugh because it's not the father who changed, but the young man who matured enough to recognize that his father's life experience gives him wisdom. Our planet has four and a half billion years experience in organizing workable living systems and fitting new species into the pattern. We're the only species that has to do it by our own conscious design. And that puts us into this very interesting point now where we have to make a shift. There, the parent planet has done very well at cleaning up what pollution species didn't clean up for each other or their part of the system that they clean up for each other, that one man's waste is another man's food kind of thing. But now we're destroying those systems. We're destroying the soils, the forests, uh, the air patterns, the climate change. So the planet can't do it as a whole if we keep going out of bounds in our own uh, pollution. And this is happening in mm -hmm. terms of uh, population and in terms of, of what we've done to Absolutely. the... Absolutely. And how we measure the economies. I know that that's mm -hmm. something that you've been very interested in. Well, just to, to get uh, to mention this population thing, uh, uh, really one of the fundamental problems, I think, picking up on what Elizabeth was saying, is that human beings have never had to organize themselves in these numbers any, at any other time in our history. We got quite good at organizing ourselves in villages. We had all sort of face-to-face -face sanctions, you know, and all of that kind of thing. But no one yet has any experience organizing a city like Mexico City with 20 million people. And so, in a sense, part of our crisis is that we don't know how to organize our societies. And, of course, that's part of the sub-problem that we don't know how to organize our economies. And the economic textbooks are all going to have to be thrown out and rewritten. I'm very unpopular in the economics profession because um, I say that very much out loud, and a lot of people are still putting their kids through college on the old royalties from the old textbooks, you know? But I mean, just to take one example, um, apart from the fact that we all know that the, the, the economic textbooks still say that air and water is free and we don't have to pay for them and, uh, you know, uh, the exploitation of nature um, has, it can be done with no cost. Uh, there's all of those things that almost everybody knows. But some of the other subtleties now that we're getting into um, are being shown up by this globalization. Now, all the economics textbooks tell you that capital is immobile. 
In other words, there's a pile of American capital here and a pile of German capital here and a pile of uh, capital here in Japan. And we know that um, it, it's actually all now mixed up in this global uh, electronic 24-hour asset management stock market game. And if you take, for example, what all of the presidential candidates have been saying, uh, they, they all say, well, uh, what we need to do is we need to have tax cut, uh, tax credits for capital, to build capital, tax credit for capital investment, and um, we need special capital gains, uh, tax relief, and stuff like that. Now, you see, that totally ignores the fact that we're in a global economy. Of course, those investors and those company managers will take all the tax credits we want to give them, and they'll invest them in the Argentine stock market. They'll put the money in Japanese bonds, which are paying higher interest rates than American treasuries. What makes them think you're going to get one net new job created in the United States. I'll go buy a Japanese product or what? You of can't course. just exist, you can't just do an intervention that affects just the United States. Exactly. And you see, so all economic theory is based on the idea that you could manage that thing called a domestic economy. It doesn't exist anymore. And so, you know, there is, it's kind of, I feel like I'm living in a funny farm somewhere sometimes because this seems so obvious. Well, I think people are very uncomfortable with the lack of control of their destiny that, that those kinds of things don't work. Yes. And when we talk about the systems approach of looking at the world as a whole, what kinds of things would work? Well, I mean, you know, the whole idea that what will work, um, instead of, uh, I mean, of course, all the candidates are saying, you know, cr create jobs. Of course, we have to create jobs. The only way that that's ever going to happen is to look at the global level and to begin to put together agreements so that we can level that global playing field in a whole new way. I mean, if you listen to what economists talk about when they say, oh, we need to level the global playing field, you know, the Japanese are not paying fair, you know, the Americans. I mean, what that is, is this basic misunderstanding that you can have a solution worked out between two countries. You have to have a solution now worked out by all countries. Absolutely. You see, the, the, this old idea, oh, well, we'll have a free trade um, zone here in the Americas. Um, What's that going to actually do except put us into competition with the 12 European nations? We have to go straight to looking at the global system and say, what would be the set of international agreements that we can all live with um, around such things as jobs, around such things as not exploiting people? You know, that the reason you have this problem with jobs is because of the wage differentials everywhere in the world. As long as companies are free, to escape um, and find a cheaper labor force, of course they're going to do that. So, or, or they find another ecosystem that they can exploit, of course they're going to do that. And so, in a sense, greening the global economy has to be done at five levels. You have to work at the international level to put these kind of agreements between countries in place. Then you have to work at the national level and you have to change the scorecard so that we're not operating on the old GNP, uh, but we're operating on a scorecard Hard, which really is more like the one you have here in Jacksonville, where you look at the total quality of life. Then you have to look at the corporate level and uh, look at the way companies uh, need to look at environmental auditing of what they're doing and what the social costs of what they're doing are to the community. And then you have to look at the local government level. Is the zoning need to be changed, you know, so that you can have solar energy and all? And of course, most importantly, the individual consumer. And consumers have to realize that there's more to life than just buying and that many of us buy more than we need at the same time that a lot of people in the world uh, don't have enough to eat. And I know that we've talked about the, this wasteful lifestyle that we seem to be the, in the forefront. We, meaning the United mm. States, seems to be in the forefront of this and how that makes such a difference to the rest of the world. If, we, if people are looking at Dallas and thinking we all live, live like that, mm -hmm. I mean, that's pretty much... And they do. <laughs> yes. And, you know, this whole thing is going to, uh, is going to be more and more on the, uh, on the agenda, I think, in this decade, where it's going to be the north, the industrialized northern hemisphere, kind of pitting itself against the south, the, the countries that didn't industrialize so much, but still are operating on the model that we taught them. And 
And you have this anomaly now that here we are, we've polluted 80% of the, um, you know, we've created 80% of the global warming phenomenon, 80% of the problem with the ozone layer. And we're now telling these people, you can't grow like us because um, that's going to pollute too much. And, and the people in the South are saying, what? You've been coming here for, for uh, you know, 100 years telling us we should copy you. And that's now, right. And now you're telling us we can't do it because we're going to pollute that last 20%. So these are going to be the conflicts of the 1990s where we're all going to have to learn from each other. Well, that certainly is yes. the conflict of the 1990s. And I think that the, this idea of this um, wasteful lifestyle may be a part of I mean, are we going to have to give up yes. our lifestyle as other people come up to the same level? Is, does everybody play in there this global are, There field? are lots of indications and good studies done that show that we can dramatically reduce our energy consumption without changing the quality of life. Now, quantity and quality are two different things. I, I also uh, was thinking a lot as you were talking, Hazel, about when we look at the world as a whole and at humans as a species, we see that one small part of our species has determined our current situation. That it really was the industrialized world that dictated to the entire planet. Mm -hmm. And many of those countries in the South are not somewhere along the road to being like us. They were systematically underdeveloped in order to develop the North. And if we're talking about futures, we can no longer have one group of people who has led us into crisis determine the fate of the planet. As a biologist, again, the first mm -hmm. lesson of nature is diversity. And it's of harmony in diversity. Every cell in your body is different. We can see how different the organs are, and yet there's no conflict. They determine the well-being of the whole together and have this wonderful nervous system that impartially collects information, sees what needs to be done, and nobody fights and says, oh, don't give the liver that much of the resources. We have to keep it all healthy. We have to put each part back on its feet, so to speak, if something goes wrong. And so the dialogue about the future of the world must be among different cultures, different peoples. As one mm -hmm. example, um, a lot of my work goes into an organization I helped to found called the Worldwide Indigenous Science Network. And working with native peoples who know a great deal about living in harmony with the living system, because they've always seen nature as a living system, and have much to teach us in their time-honored, broader, organic science, you see also the values being very different. And I, I like to talk about materialist values versus potlatch values. Many North American Indian cultures actually think of material possessions as burdensome. They wanted to move around, they didn't want to destroy ecosystems, so they made conscious decisions not to produce much. And the things that are produced in the society sometimes do pile up on someone. So you see, the goal is not to acquire as many material possessions as you can, but to keep yourself as free of them as you can. And every year they may have a potlatch ceremony at which you can give away to the rest of the society some of these things that have piled up on you indicates that you don't have enough friends and family to share with. So let's have a ceremony whereby you can unburden yourself and share in the community. And yet yeah. look how we are improvising and recreating that because there's always been as much cooperation and sharing in human societies particularly I mean in our country as well as any other country you know whether it was old barn raisings or whether yes. it's volunteerism I mean 89 million Americans volunteer five hours a week of their time and the whole problem is that the economic system ignores and doesn't reward the comp the, the cooperation in fact the old economic textbooks tell you that volunteerism and and altruism is per se irrational. This is good. I mean, can you imagine the kind of tr uh, trouble a society would got, would get, would get into? Any just the kind, just the function. kind of trouble that we've gotten into. If you tell people that um, altruistic behavior is irrational, and so of course one you know one of the things is that the economists have only looked at the money side of the picture, and they haven't looked at the other half of all of the useful work and production which is done in our society or any other, which is unpaid. Well, which is now they've not valued any 
work that, that mothers have oh, done. Oh, that's parenting children, mm -hmm. serving on the school board, uh, doing volunteer work in the community. It's just been, it, and it's half of all of the productive activity. One of the things I did in the book was to list how much larger the gross national product of all of these different countries would have been if they had counted in the unpaid and the volunteer work. Well, if they count them in, are we more similar then? Uh, yes, of course. I mean, that's the, you know, so it, the accounting system that the economists have used is basically a shell game. I mean, we've been fooling ourselves. And all that happened really was that we were piling up all of these social and environmental costs and sweeping them under the rug. Yes. And now, of course, uh, they're all coming back to haunt us. And we have to pay billions of dollars to keep the water coming out of the faucet so that we can drink it. We've got to deal with the broken families, the shuttered main streets, you know, through this crazy economic competition. That was all of the social costs and the environmental costs were just ignored on the balance sheet. Well, economics may be able to play a shell game, but biology can't. No, it can't. And one of my main interests is agriculture, looking at world agriculture, because food first was always a good motto, you know. We can't do anything else if we haven't got anything to eat. And by applying in industry to agriculture, separating plants and animals, and making artificial inputs, we have destroyed enormous amounts of soil to the point where we threaten our lives as a species. And the Green Revolution has cheated tremendously in telling us what it did. You see, the same hectareage that formerly produced rice, bananas, uh, vegetables, fruits, fish in the waters, pigs, fertilizer, mulch, all a whole total ecosystem, what we would call nowadays permaculture, is measured against the modern Green Revolution output of rice only. So you get more pounds of rice, but it's on weak little plants that can't reproduce, can't get their own water, can't get their own nutrients, and have to be constantly propped up by chemicals. And that soil is destroyed in the process. So the extra pounds are a way of, of lying with statistics. And in mm -hmm. fact, the old systems worked better. Inca agriculture was probably the most sophisticated in the history of humanity. There are many, many examples that show that modern technology is not always a solution. We have to find out where it's appropriate. Communication systems, to me, are absolutely important and must be kept up. But yep. high-tech agriculture must not be kept up. We have to go back into labor-intensive agriculture that employs people and doesn't destroy ecosystems. Well, this is pretty amazing because I think that we have, we have been the most proud of what we've done with the agriculture in, in yes. terms of productivity. And it's not sustainable. It's not I mean, the, this it's is okay not now. sustainable. I mean, just to give you an example of how it's not sustainable, this discussion that we're having with the Japanese about rice. And it is true that if you measure it by money, our rice is cheaper than theirs. But we don't count the colossal cheap energy subsidy in all of the fertilizers exactly. and the mechanization. And the way the Japanese make their rice is labor intensive. Mm -hmm. And all of the, and of course, there is a, a sacred quality to it. It's part of their culture. And so if you actually costed those things out correctly, we couldn't afford to sell our rice to the Japanese. That's right. Because of the fertilizer, because of yeah. the cost of not being... I oh, thought yeah. if we rotated our plants, we could keep the soil... Oh, firm. but that's part of the old system. Yeah. You see, we don't yeah. do that anymore. No, no, we, just we just stick fertilizer no, in it. No, and, and the, the last yeah. area of mm -hmm. colonization is in seeds, which now are going into ownership. If the GATT agreements go through, then seeds that have been developed over thousands of years uh, by peasants and native peoples will be owned because we change one gene in them and will be made infertile so that they must be purchased every year instead of traded in the old living systems way people had of operating. So and more unsustainable. And yes. this is another example, you see, of ignorant um, uh, economics. You see, the whole GATT trade agreements that have you've heard, we've all heard so much about the last two or three years. I mean, the GATT negotiators are all economists. They never learn biology. No. They never learn anything no. about ecosystems. Some of them don't even understand the laws of thermodynamics, you they're, know, they're the, the in terms of energy. And, and so you have people like that trying to make agreements. Um, they 
never heard of a rainforest. I mean, you know, the whole idea right now um, where environmental groups are trying to get into these gap meetings and saying, look, you know, if you make trade agreements that don't take into account living systems on which human economies rest, um, you know, I mean, this is a step backward. And yet the GATT also could be a huge step forward. If we had understanding of living systems incorporated in all those GATT agreements, then they would uh, provide a, a tremendously good framework for the kind of new greening of the economy that I'm talking about. People are catching on. I think people who wouldn't have cared about the rainforest before now care. They mm -hmm. care about some of the other things mm -hmm. that science is doing, um, polluting the air and those kinds of things. It, are we going another direction or are we still going? I mean, the seed thing is mm -hmm. really a con source of concern. Absolutely. Um, and that the ownership of the seeds is the bad issue there, too. You see, by owning them, we could actually find the people who developed them from using them in the future. And this, this notion that we must own the whole planet and that we must focus on production and devalue the natural reproduction of ecosystems has gotten us into such terrible danger. But we are waking up. There were two wonderful international conferences of women held here in Florida last November that indicated to me that women are very in tune with living systems. They understand very well. There were hundreds of women from Africa, from Latin America, all working on grassroots projects to re-green the earth, to clean up the wastes. And there were women politicians and intellectuals and people who understood things like the Green Revolution and these GATT issues. Uh, Vandana Shiva, the physicist from India, is marvelous on these issues. And you just had the feeling that if we could balance our societies better, and from a biological point of view, it's crazy to waste the resources of the women, that we might get out of the crisis faster. Oh, I, I agree with you, Elizabeth. I mean, I, I think it, it is beca becoming clear to a lot of people that human beings do come in two different configurations, you know. Mm -hmm. And the idea that all of the decision-making gets made by one, one sex or one gender, I mean, is just uh, very unbalanced, bound to be very unbalanced. Mm -hmm. So I think this philosophy about women being in, in tune with the nature, with nature, is probably a very sound one. I think men are tending to come from this other point of view, which is trying to overcome nature or, or control. civilize it, control nature. Mm -hmm. And I just want, you know, is it too late for them? I mean, we're going to have to bring all everyone along no. this philosophy. See, the, the answer lies in balance. And uh, men have been primarily the inventors, the industrialists. And after all, for hundreds of years in Europe, only boys were educated, and they were educated in mathematics, in logic, in mechanical languages. And so now it's time for us to regain the balance. The women who got left out of those schools and stayed in the gardens, in a sense, have a very profound knowledge now that's very valuable, very necessary. And I think if we bring the best of these two uh, halves together to form a new hole, we'll be in business for a long time. That's great, and let's, we'll leave it there because hopefully we'll all be on the track of, of looking at the whole systems and, and regaining some of the things we've lost in the past. Thank you very much for being with us. This has sure. been Hazel Henderson and Elizabeth Satoris and Carol Miner talking with you about a sustainable future that I hope we'll all have in the <laughs> 90s and beyond. Thank you.